Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm your host, Sharmeen Ali. Today we will be discussing a U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan, Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad's visit to Islamabad, where he met with Prime Minister Imran Khan, the Chief of Army Staff, General Kamar Javed Bajwa, and Foreign Minister uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi. In these meetings, uh, they basically, uh, the topic was about Prime Minister Imran Khan's recent visit to the U.S. and the understanding that he had with President Trump about Pakistan's supportive role in the Afghan peace process and as well as uh, what further steps need to be taken by Pakistan, how they can be more facilitative in their role. Uh, we'll also be discussing in our studio with our guests a recent internet study that was undertaken comparing the different behaviors of the dif different genders, males and females on the internet, and what their various concerns are concerning harassment and privacy, etc., misinformation and such uh, different uh, areas of concern amongst people using the internet. So we'll be discussing that with the cyber expert as well on our program. But let's begin with uh, Ambassador Khalil Zad's visit to Islamabad with our guest who uh, is in our studio today. But first, we're going to show you a report. Yesterday, Zalmay Khalil Zad, the special representative for Afghanistan reconciliation, arrived in Islamabad to brief the Pakistani leadership on the ongoing peace talks with the Taliban. Prime Minister Imran Khan commended Khalil Zad's efforts and stated that a peaceful Afghanistan is in the interest of Pakistan. The U.S. envoy also met with the Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi, who tweeted that Pakistan remains committed to the peace and reconciliation process in Afghanistan. Zalmay Khalilzad has recently been on a streak of meetings with the Taliban in order to restore peace to the war-trodden Afghanistan. His proposed peace agreement with the Taliban encompasses four major factors. The withdrawal of foreign troops, a Taliban guarantee to prevent terrorist attacks, inter-Afghan dialogue leading to a political settlement, and a permanent ceasefire. Khalilzad states, if Taliban do their part, we will do ours and conclude the agreement that we have been working on. Despite the best efforts towards peace, violence is on the rise in Afghanistan. The attacks have intensified over the last few weeks with both the Taliban and the Afghan forces trying to leverage their positions in the agreement. In his meeting with Khalilzad, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan stressed on the importance of intra-Afghan dialogue. So we've just seen this report, and now I'd like to welcome Mr. Rof Hassan, who is an international affairs expert, and he's also the CEO of the Regional Peace Institute. Thank you so much, sir, for joining Thank us you today. So let's begin with uh, Ambassador <laughs> Khalilzad's visit to Islamabad. Now, this is following Prime Minister Imran Khan's meeting with President Trump. There's a follow-up visit to that. What needs to be done next is what was basically discussed, and how can Pakistan play a more facilitative role? So, so can you just elaborate on that? What would have the discussion been about? How is Islamabad expected to facilitate this process even further, other than bringing the parties on the table to talk like they've done previously? As enumerated in, in the report that you've just uh, uh, telecast, there were four steps okay. to the peace deal. Number one, uh, an assurance by Taliban that the Afghan soil would not be used against any, for any terrorist activity. And mm -hmm. two, uh, commitment by the U.S. to withdraw troops and uh, giving a timeline for that. These two have been kind of sorted out. And, uh, you know, according to Khalil Zad himself, you know, there is a draft agreement in these two. He is there, the U.S. has not given the timeline simply because they're waiting for the other two to be resolved. Mm -hmm. The other two are, number one, holding up an intra afghan dialogue, mm -hmm. which will ultimately lead to the fourth, which is a comprehensive ceasefire in Afghanistan. Okay. The Taliban have not agreed to any of the last two. They are unwilling to negotiate directly with the Afghan government, and they are not willing to ceasefire till such time that a peace agreement has been signed. Uh, between between uh, the Taliban and the U.S. So, in response to the question that you put to me, basically, uh, Pakistan has been playing the role of a facilitator. Okay. They are the ones, basically, who uh, uh, put the U.S. and Taliban together on uh, on on the negotiations table. But what is being expected of Pakistan now that it will it will it will transit uh, from being a facilitator, merely a facilitator, to becoming a mediator? Mm -hmm. That means that it has to convince the Taliban to get to the negotiating table with the, with the Afghan government and then also persuade them, try to persuade them that they should, they should, they should agree to a ceasefire, you know, because after all, it is the blood of the Afghans which mm -hmm. is being uh, split. Absolutely. So uh, these are the challenges, you know, which, uh, which Pakistan, they expect of Pakistan to undertake. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, there are uh, the pitfalls in this, basically, you know, because Pakistan has been involved in the Afghan imbroglio for the last 40 years, you know, and I don't think it has won uh, uh, such a good name there also because there's a lot of resentment uh, within the Afghans regarding the role that Pakistan has played. 
Uh, I'm not accusing anybody as such, you know, but I'm just trying to describe mm -hmm. the actual, been a you know, the actually, what, 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 what uh, the kind of feelings, you know, which actually exist on, uh, you know, on ground in Afghanistan. So, <clears throat> expecting a Pakistan to get more involved in this in this thing uh, and going beyond the, the 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 role of that of a facilitator possibly is plunging it into an imbroglio, you know, which 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 will be difficult to 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 come out of, in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in later times. So, Pakistan has to tread the path very carefully. Okay. Uh, very, very carefully. What is it that it can actually do? It must be very certain, very sure that this is something that it can do yes. and it can deliver. Okay. And it must only get into doing that. Mm -hmm. It must not try to overextend itself, you know. It must not try to, uh, uh, you know, think of doing things that, uh, that it knows that it cannot. Mm -hmm. So uh, com making commitments at this stage possibly, you know, would be kind of... Uh, uh, taking a chance, taking a risk, you know, and I have, I have strongly cautioned it, mm -hmm. cautioned it mm -hmm. against that kind of approach. Of course, um, the Americans are very keen to get out of Afghanistan. President Trump has been saying that we are going to get out of Afghanistan before the end of the year. Mike Pompeo has also said the same thing. Consequently, they are in a rush to get out. Right. And they want Pakistan to facilitate their exit from Afghanistan. Okay, so and what is it that is in, pa in Pakistan's capability to accomplish in this process? See, uh, Pakistan has possibly done what it could, which is to facilitate the Taliban and U.S. talks. Okay. That, that was because of Pakistan, and Pakistan has been duly uh, complimented for that. Uh, Pakistan's induction into the group of three, big three, in Beijing on the 10th and 11th of July, alongside China, Russia, and U.S., was a recognition, was a, was a, was a very uh, public recognition of the role right. that Pakistan has played so far. Mm -hmm. But becoming a mediator, that means providing guarantees on behalf of the Taliban. For example, there's another thing, you know, which I, we need to discuss in this. You know. First, of course, is what is expected of Pakistan is that, number one, it should convince the Taliban to talk to the government of Kabul. Mm -hmm. Second, the huge challenge that, uh, that we have is the post-peace and reconciliation scenario in Afghanistan. Hypothetically, if there is a peace agreement between the U.S. and Taliban, which, according to my information, they already have the contours of that agreement, you know, and all that is needed is, uh, are the signatures, which is going to happen in due course of time. But post-peace and reconciliation, post-withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan position, what is going to happen in that Afghanistan? Yeah, what next? Yeah. See, because a general fear is being expressed you know, by most of the people who know the situation in Afghanistan that, you know, the Taliban would make an effort to take over Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, to the detriment of all other stakeholders. And this right. is a concern that the international community has. This is a concern that a lot of people also have. They would not like the Taliban to be ruling Afghanistan independent of all other stakeholders. Yeah. So these are two things that the, that the Americans want Pakistan to address. Number mm -hmm. one, bring the Taliban to talk to the government of Kabul. And two, to assure and ensure that the Taliban do not go for taking over Afghanistan. Right. I feel that while the first one could be doable, and I think in that context, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan possibly is going to meet the Taliban also, but the second is something that Pakistan should avoid, strictly avoid, because it assuring or guaranteeing that the Taliban would act in this way or that way mm. or not act in this way or that way is something that is taking a huge risk, which can further jeopardize uh, the public sentiment about Pakistan. Right, the power sharing arrangement is not yeah. something that's in Pakistan's control now, sir. It, a couple of days ago, a blast killed on a bus 34 Afghans and wounded 17 also. It was a roadside bomb. And then uh, amongst them were women and children primarily. And then according to a UN report, uh, 1,366 civilians have been killed and 2,446 wounded during the first six <clears throat> months of 2019, just this year. And children are amongst a third of those casualties. Now, this is still going on. There's no peace in Afghanistan. There's still fighting going on. And although there's been an agreement in Doha that civilian casualties will be avoided and places such as schools and hospitals will not be targeted, yet we're still seeing these civilians and women and children's casualties. See, we've seen a transition in Afghanistan in the last 10 years. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, Taliban were not such a formidable entity, mm -hmm. but they have become a formidable entity now, and that is simply because of the, because of the firepower that they have indulged in. Mm -hmm. They've gained. They've become ascendant. They've gained ground. They, they control more territory in Afghanistan today as compared to 10 years ago. So there is, this, is, this is the weapon that they've used very effectively to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So expecting of them that they're going to discontinue using it, and agree to a ceasefire is something that I feel is beyond my reckoning. I don't mm -hmm. think they're going to do that. As long as there is a peace agreement on, 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 on table and the, the signatures you know, which, are, which, are, which, which have been appended. 
So this this fratricide is going to continue for as long as as there is no peace deal. And I think it is it, it is also alongside other reasons. It is also for this reason that the Americans are eager to sign the peace deal yesterday rather than today. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally believe that the only impediment in the way of signing the peace deal now is that they somehow want to bring the government of Kabul on board, mm -hmm. which is which is a huge challenge, which is a huge challenge. Because, because Afghan, uh, the Taliban don't recognize that government. They don't recognize the government. government. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they believe that they are the government, you know which was wrongfully removed you know, back in 2001 when the Americans attacked Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They feel they're still the de facto, they're, they're not the de facto government, but they are the de jure government. You know? This is their conviction. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the basis on which they, 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 they talk to uh, other uh, stakeholders, which is, I mean, most notable, of course, is the US. And they say that the government of Kabul is, 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 is just a stooge government, it's just a puppet They government. refuse to meet them in an official capacity, but they're willing to meet them as civilians, ordinary civilians. So that is a step forward, that they're meeting those uh, individuals as individuals and not as government representatives and um, amongst I think the delegation of the Afghan government that went to Doha and had a meeting with the Taliban there were also women representatives present and everything so that is a, a good step forward and there were also uh, leader members of the civilian society as well so I mean um, meeting them on a basis of an official basis do you think that they will come to some kind of intra-Afghan agreement amongst themselves the current Afghan government and the Taliban Leaders. So we just did a trilateral dialogue. My, my, my think tank conducted a trilateral dialogue yesterday, you know, encompassing Afghanistan, China, and Pakistan. And uh, the fundamental point that emerged from that trilateral yesterday here in Islamabad was that at the end of the day, it is the Afghans themselves who have to ensure that there is peace in that country. Yep. So there has to be a level of unity and homogeneity among them, and that unfortunately is missing at this juncture. Mm -hmm. They're fighting amongst, they're fighting the Taliban, they're fighting so many other forces, but they're also fighting one another. Mm. So they have to create a level of homogeneity. In, in, in addition to holding the intra-Afghan dialogue, which of course was brokered you know, in Doha that was held on the, uh, I think, 7th and 8th of July, that mm. was brokered by the Germans, that was a good step forward, mm. in which I understand that the Taliban, you know, was sitting face to face with these four ladies, you know, who mm -hmm. who took part in in, in, yeah. in that interaction, and these four ladies were very vocal. Particularly, one of them was very, very vocal, and I think that was that was good. And I am also given to understand that the Taliban handled the situation rather rather well, rather well. Okay. And the that the declaration that was uh, released at the at the at the at the conclusion of that uh, intra Afghan dialogue. Mm -hmm. It is not a step forward in the sense that they did meet the ladies, they did meet those people, they did talk to them. But at the end of the day, uh, the one thing that the rest of the world wants out of the Taliban is to agree to granting uh, human rights to, to women and you know uh, other communities. So the, the but, Taliban have said that women's rights would be protect, uh, protected, albeit in an Islamic framework. That's it. So who's going to define that Islamic framework? Mm -hmm. So post peace and reconciliation, uh, Afghanistan, who's going to define that? So I think the, the, the Taliban are going to be the dominant force, so it is going to be their interpretation, which is a very conservative and very decadent uh, interpretation. Yes, and according to the Taliban, okay, now in the previous government, uh, women can't leave home without chaperones, That's they right. can't work and they can't get an education. Right. So those ladies who were there, we were not obviously there to, I would love to listen into what they had to no, say. No, you should have gone. But I'm sure that they would have had a lot to say in that regard. And uh, But the Taliban said that they can't agree uh, accept anything other than a strictly Islamic kind of a regime over there because their commanders have given too many sacrifices and all of that. So strictly Islamic then means that the women will have these restrictions. So how, what ends up happening to the human rights like you said earlier? Yeah, my, my, I've written quite frequently in Afghanistan in the recent past, you know, and my, my analysis is very simple and basic, you know, that we are looking forward to an Afghanistan ruled by the Taliban. And the Americans are virtually doing that also. They're, they're handing it over on a platter to them because the only force other than the Americans that is actually there in Afghanistan, that is the Taliban force. Mm -hmm. And I, what I foresee is that when the peace and reconciliation agreement has been signed between the US and the Taliban, bulk of the people who are working for the Afghan National Army, they're going to defect to the Taliban mm -hmm. because Taliban is the emerging force. The government in Kabul is the declining force. Yeah. This is the reality that you can face. And that, you know, uh, uh, the, the stalemate was there or the Afghan or the Taliban were not able to take over Afghanistan simply because of the presence of foreign troops there. Mm -hmm. If they had not been there, but in spite of their presence, the Taliban have gained control, more control, let's say. They had more area which, is, which they're controlling at this Absolutely. moment in time. Even though, so the yeah. moment the Americans leave, the paradigm is going to change.
Yeah. It's going to be a different pilot. Dynamics are going to change. Right. So there's going to be a surge uh, by Taliban, and I think they shall ultimately be ruling Afghanistan. Unless, of course, other things are decided between now and the signing of the peace team. I mean, right. multiple other things come into 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 the foray, and which are included in the in the peace deal and all that. But I don't see anyone stopping the Taliban from a takeover. Right. In Ambassador Khalilzad said that a peace deal is imminent. Those are his yes, words, meaning right. that it's going to be very soon, that's that right. we can expect it very soon. Now, the U.S. has a tentative kind of deadline of September 1st to uh, accomplish the peace deal so that uh, before the Afghan elections begin. So um, let's put things in perspective, because now we're expecting cooperation between the Taliban and the Afghan government. But 20 people, uh, people were killed on Sunday, the first day of uh, campaigning, official day of campaigning in Kabul, where gunmen targeted pre uh, President Ashraf Ghani's running mate's office, uh, Amrullah Saleh's office. So you're seeing these things happen when the campaigning has just started. And we're expecting them to actually peacefully have an election process. Is there, are we expecting more bloodshed before the elections, even if there is a ceasefire agreement between the U.S. government and um, the, uh, the Taliban and inside Afghanistan, will we be seeing more violence? See, see, in order to, like you say, you want to discuss it in a larger perspective, you know, which are those forces which want elections in Afghanistan at this moment in time? The Taliban don't want an election. Bulk of the political forces in Afghanistan do not want an election. Mm -hmm. It is President Ghani and his country of people who want elections in Afghanistan. Why? Because they feel that they should win the election somehow. They should be legitimized. And they should be legitimized election. for mm -hmm. another five years. Mm -hmm. This is not acceptable to virtually anybody else in Afghanistan at this juncture. And if there is a peace deal concluded between the U.S. and Taliban, there will be no presidential election in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Most probably, an interim government is going to be ducted, given, which will be given about 18 to 24 months to work on the constitution and reframe it on the basis of input they receive from the Taliban. Okay. And that interim government also ensures the intra-Afghan dialogue because all stakeholders, all ethnic groups in Afghanistan would become founding members of that interim government. Okay. So it is not going to be a question of one talking to the other or one not talking to the other. They will all be part of the interim government. So they will have to sit together to, to, sit to, to redefine the constitution yeah. and all that. And so this, we're talking that, about something that's a month away. Yeah, that's right. So okay. that is a feasible way. That is a very practical way. And this has been on the table for almost six to eight months now. Mm. And I feel that this is going to happen. So instead of holding the elections now, now, and the other condition that the Taliban are attaching is that we will hold, we will not hold the presidential elections in Afghanistan until and unless the last soldier, foreign soldier, has been withdrawn from there. Mm -hmm. So if this interim government is given 18 months to 24 months to reframe the constitution and all that, that will be the time given to the Americans to withdraw troops and NATO withdraw troops. Right. So then you will have a foreign presence free Afghanistan, and that means that you will move towards the elections. Now, what the other stakeholders fear is that in a situation like that, when there is nobody to ensure implementation of the, of, of, of the peace deal, the Taliban are going to emerge hugely ascendant and they possibly would control 60, 70, 80 percent, you know, even in the parliament. Mm. So they can move to take over. They would be virtually taking over Afghanistan, not by fighting for it, but by, but through, through democratic means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the fears that the others have. So they want uh, certain assurances, certain uh, commitments, you know, from international stakeholders and also from the Taliban that this is not going to happen. And this is where the pressure on Pakistan is going. Mm -hmm. The pressure to play a role which is which is going to be much more than than that of a facilitator. Okay. So, you know, it has to come into the into the fray and say that, all right, you know, we will we will we will do this. That is where I caution Pakistan not to get into that because it's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, bargain. And yeah. I think uh, it just does not have the wherewithal to ensure or give that kind of assurance to foreign stakeholders. Okay, so the Taliban control half of the territory in Afghanistan right now. And you're saying that in, in parliament they can control even a larger uh, majority than uh, that you had just mentioned at the moment. But um, now that we're talking about the elections coming up, now to, you're saying, you know, we, we were just mentioning how it's going to be Taliban control. There are other ethnic groups in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. So let's talk about this. What can potentially happen if you have a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan? What would happen to the other ethnic groups? How can you assure that that country is going to be stable? That's not in Pakistan's hands, number one. And secondly, how can we assure that it, their territory will not be used against any other foreign country, which is the assurance that the U.S. wants? You see, there is this debate um, uh, among people who 
who discuss Afghanistan, there are two possibilities that mm -hmm. can emerge. That Taliban have actually changed, as some people are predicting, that they actually are they not as stubborn, as inflexible as they used to be. Mm -hmm. And they at least are talking about uh, giving rights to women and you know, such other, such other uh, weaker communities. Mm -hmm. But the other narrative, you know, is that they are the same. The mindset has not changed. They remain as inflexible as uh, when they were ruling Afghanistan back in the back back in 2001. Mm -hmm. So, if there is there, if we go by the narrative that there has been a level of flexibility which has come into the Taliban, then it is possible that they may like to coexist with these other forces, other ethnic groups, and other stakeholders in Afghanistan. Okay. But these stakeholders, because we have worked very closely with Afghanistan, these stakeholders, very young people, mm -hmm. who have ruled Afghanistan for the last 15, 16, 17 years with, with President Karzai and now with President Ghani, they are very young. They are in the late 20s, early 30s, mid 30s, you know, and they are foreign educated. They've studied in America, in India, in China, in Pakistan, in Europe, everywhere. They're very, very educated, they're very enlightened, and they have a different worldview as compared to the Taliban. So, for me, their coexistence is something, you know, which is going to be on the face of it very difficult. Very difficult. I mean, given, of course, uh, the fact, you know, that the Taliban changed so much that they transit to becoming a different kind of breed altogether. I don't think that so is going to happen. So, if you put it in a historical perspective, how did, you've had the Taliban rule Afghanistan before. How That's did right. that work out for the civilians over there? Well, it, is, it was a draconian rule. It was a draconian yeah. rule. I mean, people used to be sort of, you know, uh, uh, eliminated in public. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, it was not a, not a very democratic uh, rule. It was not even a very human rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we expect them to kind of rule Afghanistan yet again if they come into power now? There is a possibility of that. Okay. There's a lingering possibility of that. Mm -hmm. I feel, see, because my personal, my personal assertion has been that there is very little that has changed about Taliban. They may say that they have changed. They may say that, you know, they will give uh, uh, rights to women, you know, subject to Sharia and all that. But two things, when they come into power, it, become, it may become a different narrative. And then, number two, the interpretation of Sharia is going to be theirs, not anybody exactly. else's. It, so they may define it the way it is going. Yes. So it's a very tricky ground that we are walking. But I don't foresee a democratic government under the Taliban. That is completely out so far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And how do you foresee the, the future of women in, Afghan in Afghanistan after the U.S. has withdrawn, after their elections? And that's one of the questions that is, you know, weighing heavy on a lot of people's minds because they're the first, uh, you know, group in, in, in the country <clears throat> that gets affected under a, a so-called draconian rule. See, depends on who's ruling Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. If there's a coalition and Taliban are just one part of the coalition, you may, you may, you may see a level of democracy. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a level of human rights there, including uh, human rights of women. But if it is the Taliban who are dominant or who are the sole rulers of Afghanistan, I see a plunge back into the past. Mm -hmm. I don't see that there's going to be much difference between now and the kind of uh, administration that they were running back in 2001 or earlier than that. You don't I don't see, a see big unfortunately, difference. I don't see and that. And so these peace talks that are happening now, they're between the US and Afghanistan and Pakistan, but there are other countries that are involved with Afghanistan and who have strategic relations and who get affected by what happens over there, right. such as Iran, and you have uh, India, you have <clears throat> Russia. So what, what about those countries being involved in a peace dialogue about what should be happening in Afghanistan for the region's greater stability? Well, that, that's, that's very important. <clears throat> uh, you see, if you go back in the, in, the, in the 90s, you know, then the dynamics then were totally different. You know, we used to have something called the uh, Northern Alliance. Yes, and uh, these, exactly. this Northern Alliance, you know, they were supported by the Russians, they were supported by the Iranians, they were supported by the Indians, mm -hmm. while the Taliban were supported by the Saudi clan in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So pa Taliban emerged victorious in the end, you know, so they ruled Afghanistan for five years, you know, and then, of course, came the American uh, intervention. Okay. So it's a different story. Now dynamics have changed. Mm -hmm. Number one, Iran and U.S. have this confrontation. And you know it's, it's it's a huge confrontation, you know. So I I I'm given to understand that Iran too was invited to this uh, this this uh, three big talks in uh, in in Beijing, but they refused to attend. Uh, but I also understand that they are in touch with the Taliban. I also understand I mean, you, there have been two rounds in uh, intra Afghan rule uh, meetings in in Moscow. So the Russians are engaged with work you know in in, in working with Taliban. So. I see that the paradigm has changed to the extent to you know that possibly there's going to be no revival of the former Northern Alliance. So there's not going to be an outbreak war between mm -hmm. two factions, but the possibility and likelihood of a civil war in Afghanistan remains. And that is something that I'm ri writing on this week, you know, it'll appear and I'll send you a link to that piece, you know. So mm -hmm. that remains, that remains. Uh, if Taliban, if Taliban come into power, then there is going to be a level of civil war. There's mm -hmm. going to be a level of civil war initiated by these, these, these ethnic groups, these, these stakeholders, you know, who would not be assimilated into the new paradigm, which is going to be constructed by the Taliban. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. So uh, this is based this on is how weird. flexible they have become, which according to me is going to be very little. Mm -hmm. So you know they will be left out. Bulk of them have dual nationalities. Bulk of them are going to leave the country again. So it's going to be like back to uh, back to square one. Uh, to square so one. it is going to become a, a, a country predominant predominantly ruled by, by the Taliban, which is not good for Afghans, which is not good, good for the future of Afghanistan. Right. So Pakistan has to play its cards very, very, very carefully and very sagaciously. So to, in order to ensure a ceasefire, which is what the agreement and the peace talks are focusing on, you also have to make sure now how united are the Taliban that they're going to ensure that all their fractions and groups <coughs> are going to cooperate in that ceasefire. And then you also have the element of IS. How do you uh, manage them? Because the recent attacks that have happened in Kabul, the Taliban have neither denied or claimed the attack. It could even be IS. So how is that group going to be contained in all of this? For, for, for a considerable period of time, there has been a, there has been a talk that there is a, there's, a, there's a divergence between the battleground uh, commanders and the political leadership of Taliban. But the only instance whereby we can make, an, make, 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 make an analysis of that is when the Taliban announced a ceasefire on last Eid al, Eid al Fitr, not okay. this one, but last year, mm -hmm. and they stopped firing to the to the to the, to the man. Okay. There was no firing at all. Mm -hmm. And when after three days there were calls to extend the ceasefire, and they said no, we will not. Then you know the the war started again. again okay. So they have you know to me basically they are a united force. So this okay. narrative you know which some people are trying to build you know that they are 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 factions and groups you know which work under the umbrella mm -hmm. of the Taliban. I don't think that is correct. You know, I think they subscribe to the same leader, uh, Habibullah, and I think they they, they, they they listen to his orders. So it is a it is a more or less a unified force. So that is another um, uh, element of fear. You know that the that the other stakeholders will have to contend with. So it is not going to be a divergent uh, coalition of groups. It is it is it is basically a unified group. You know that they're dealing with. There has nothing else has happened since then, whereby I could say that no, they're not united. They're divided. Sure, okay. So it is basically a united thing. See. All stakeholders have a have a have a have a have a role to play in in forging peace in Afghanistan, and and and, and the way out will not be that they leave this country and they settle somewhere else. I think they really must make you know give it the best, mm -hmm. give it the best. All of them should give it the best, you know, to have peace and reconciliation. Thank you in so Afghanistan. much, sir. Thank My you pleasure. so much, uh, Mr. Rofa Sin It was a very, very, very interesting much. discussion. We hope to have you again on our program, uh, viewers. After this break, we're going to speak about the trends in internet usage in Pakistan and amongst the two different two genders and how they perceive the different risks involved in internet usage and what their different trends are. So stay with us after this break. We'll continue this discussion. Sitar is a plucked string instrument used in Pakistani classical music. The instrument flourished under the Mughal Empire. Sitar is named after a Persian word. Welcome back. And now we're going to be speaking to Amal Ghani, who's a cyber analyst and an expert on internet usage in Pakistan. We're going to uh, speak to her in a minute about uh, this topic, but first we have a package to show you. Women use of internet. This was the finding of a report, Internet as we see it by Media Matters for Democracy. The research found that men and women understand and experience harassment differently in the online spaces. 
what constitutes as harassment for women might not be considered harassment by men men and women also react on harassment in online spaces differently with women at the same time completely disabling their social media profile both genders they also found cybercrime laws pertaining harassment and in most cases they go to the solution for bullying threats and harassment was self consortship instead of reporting to the relevant authority these limitations are not just limiting for women's own use but it's also limiting for our own economy for our own country in that sense um, because half of your population is still completely unable to experience the technology in its full potential pakistan sadly is very patriarchal which means that the permission culture prevents women from accessing the internet because the men in their family refuse them to because they feel that it's an honor issue um unfortunately because of this there's a lot of cyber bullying online the research also explores concern both men and women have about data protection and privacy on the internet especially so we just saw this report so amal thank you for joining us and welcome to our program thank you for having me let's start by talking about the different types of internet usage that we have in pakistan mm -hmm. this study shows what exactly apps are predominantly being used in pakistan and what use is the internet being uh, utilized by people especially the young people in pakistan right so one of the questions we asked people during this research was that what do they understand by the word internet right which also kind of shows their usage yeah. so when people were talking about the internet they identify the internet as referring to both things that they use on a smartphone and also on laptops mm -hmm. but then when they were talking about their usage they primarily talked about apps like whatsapp for instance or facebook or social media apps that help them connect to other people and talk to other people with their friends or their family so that sort of thing so connectivity connectivity okay. essentially yes okay and yeah. okay so they're using those apps and what about for like using google for research and things like that how prevalent is that like the very very positive uses of the internet that could potentially really enhance you know your studies and things like that yeah so that's very interesting so when like one focus group when we asked them what the term internet meant to them one of the first answer they said was google mm -hmm. right and then we also saw usage amongst especially professionals they were using youtube videos for tutorials so we okay. had one woman who spoke about how she learned coding through youtube tutorials mm -hmm. and was now freelancing on the internet a lot of people who used websites like linkedin to manage their projects or to find work right and then also using the internet to manage their projects and to find clients and to work with clients mm -hmm. so a lot of that kind of usage also okay but mostly it's for connectivity now yeah. Uh, yeah. that element for example the lady on the report was saying mm -hmm. that a lot of women are not allowed the use of internet because of it's perceived as an honor issue that would be the case in more of the rural areas and things like that because you hear people say saying that you know so and so is always on her mobile which is supposed to be a bad thing you know whereas uh, who knows what they're doing on their mobile they could be learning something uh, or whatever i mean if even a young girl can learn how to cook on the internet or on youtube and yeah. things like that but it's perceived as a negative thing by a lot of families yeah. so how was that seen amongst the so when we started speaking to we had different discussions with men and women right so a lot of the women spoke about building trust with the family before they were allowed to use social media or in the or limiting the ways in which they would use social media so a lot of them said that we get permission for for instance using it for educational purposes but then were prevented from sharing pictures mm. right so there was there were limitations so they were constantly negotiating with their families the kind of access they would have to the internet the kind of apps they were using on it and the purposes they were using it for uh we also spoke to men about access that they gave to women in their families right so a lot of uh, men agreed to the fact that access especially as you mentioned in rural areas was limited to women where honor issues were associated with the use of the internet and families were did not feel secure letting their women go on the internet or use the internet so one of the major uses despite that was whatsapp that came across Mm. right because even if you're not on facebook or on social media whatsapp is an app that's avail easily available on all levels of smartphones right so if you have a simple smartphone it doesn't even have to be expensive you're still you still have access to whatsapp right exactly yeah. so let me ask you this one of the concerns about internet usage usage especially social media mm -hmm. is harassment and particularly mm -hmm. for women recently the ombudsman's office and the federal ombudsman mm -hmm. kashmala tarik has said that sending a person messages that say good morning every day kind of a thing and i think a lot of women have yeah. experienced that that is she's judged that it is harassment so what is your opinion about that so um 
I mean, my opinion as a woman would be to agree with a lot of what uh, women were saying within the study that we had. So a lot of the women found, like, agreed with Kishmala Tariq in that sense, where they said that somebody, an unwanted message in their inbox or their WhatsApp or any other social media platform, they considered it a harassment. But then when we were speaking to men about the same issue, they said that they don't consider, consider it harassment because men don't find those messages as intrusive. Or maybe the consequences of those messages for men aren't as harsh because we talked about access earlier, right? Mm. So for instance, if I'm a woman and a, and a man I don't know sends me a simple good morning message, my family might not like it very much and might restrict my access. But if I'm a man, I don't have the same kind of social conditions placed on me. Yeah. What about those people who will repeat, repeatedly send a message every day, good yeah. morning or whatever yeah. it is, and the person is not responding. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we had a program with Dr. Fazia Said about mm -hmm. harassment. She was mm -hmm. one of the people who wrote down and uh, penned out the harassment yeah. laws. Mm -hmm. So what she said was that after three messages, if somebody does not respond and then you keep continuing yeah. to contact them, that's harassment. Yeah. So what uh, would you say about that? Or, you know, did your respondents have anything to say? Like I mean, that? so our study was largely about the perceptions, the way people understand understand their behavior online and what we found was that men don't consider it harassment despite there being legal uh, you know there being legal implications for it or like a legal definition of harassment a lot of men don't consider simple inbox inbox messages harassment whereas women do view it, view it as harassment mm -hmm. and, and right. they just think it's fine it's yeah. like whatever regular yeah uh, they feel like it's not as intrusive it doesn't bother you you can ignore it you can delete the message it goes into your other inboxes so maybe it doesn't reach you but then we also had cases where women were talking about you know like repeated messages but also like inappropriate repeated messages like videos they were being sent mm -hmm which were quite inappropriate in nature. So I, so the, I, like one thing that came across in the study was that men don't really know the extent of the harassment that takes place because mm. they haven't faced it. They haven't faced it to yeah. that extent. Yeah. I, I happen to agree yeah. with that as well. And also a lot of people say you have the option to block the person. Mm -hmm. But then there are those very persistent harassers who yeah. can show up on another platform and then another one yeah. then and then yeah. show up a few years later as well. Yeah. I know of people who that's happened to because mm -hmm. there's some very persistent people. Yeah. And the reason they do it is also because uh, we've spoken to the cyber crimes, FIA cyber yeah. crimes wing director and he said they're not uh, they're not aware of cyber crime laws. A lot of them, when they yeah. get caught and brought in, <laughs> they say that they're not, they didn't know it was yeah. breaking the law, right? Yeah. So I think it's important to say right now on our program that this is breaking the law. So yeah. that it's very, <laughs> very sure. clear yeah. that if they keep uh, messaging girls who are not responding, yeah. it, it is a crime. Yeah. So that's one of the things. They, they say lack of knowledge or lack of awareness yeah. is the reason they kept doing it. But I think. Does it, have to, does it have to be a law preventing uh, somebody from behaving in a certain manner or should it just be a conscience thing that you should not repeatedly yeah. keep uh, you know, reaching out to a person who doesn't want to respond to you? So I think that's also one of the recommendations that we came up with as part of the study was that you have to start educating people about their behavior online, right? There has to be awareness for both men and women as to what constitutes harassment, even in an online space. For instance, somebody might be more wary of their behavior when they're present physically in front of you, but might, might not consider the same behavior offensive offline because it gives you an anonymity. You, like for instance, men don't think that a message in your other's inbox is as harmful or as intruding, right? So I think we, we did speak, like one of the recommendations was that you need to start speaking to people who use the internet from a young age, make it part of maybe the curriculum to start talking about what online, what is appropriate online behavior. Mm. And I think another aspect of the study that's yeah. very important is that when you talked about the FIA is that a lot of women said they don't report harassment. Mm. So maybe also awareness yeah. there as to like what the legal term harassment means and in what cases that they can, is what are the cases in which they can go and report harassment okay. and what the mechanism for that is because a lot of women felt did not feel comfortable reporting harassment. Mm -hmm. And then because I think to a certain extent it's so normalized that they don't feel like making the extra effort to going into They're reporting. afraid of their own exposure as yeah, well. I definitely. think a lot of women hesitate because of that. They yeah. don't want their name coming out in public. Yeah. They want to remain anonymous. But it was very clear, uh, the, the FIA said that we don't, it, the, the woman, her identity remains safe. Right. Uh, you know, but at the same time, did any of the respondents feel that the harassment or cybercrime laws can be used, misused also, to get somebody into trouble who's innocent? Definitely. There was a lot of concern about, so one of the themes was data privacy and data protection. And during that, we saw concerns about laws and how they might be misused yeah. to, to impact citizens. So yes, there was, there was definitely a lot of concern around those mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay, so when you come to data privacy, okay, yeah. that, that's a totally different yeah. issue because now, okay, you use the internet and companies then utilize your information yeah. for further purposes. Yeah. How did your respondents feel about that? So, uh, I was actually surprised to see the level of discussion that the respondents across all socioeconomic backgrounds were having, having on this, right? They were all very concerned about they came up with the examples that we've seen in the past, like the Edward Snowden case, right? So they kept referring to the yeah. Edward Snowden files, which is a movie, right? Uh, which talks about data privacy and data protection and state surveillance. And then they also talked about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which once again was uh, apps being used to spy on people and, you know, get getting an understanding of their behavior and their voting patterns and things like yes, that. Exactly. So, yeah, there was a lot of concern. People talk about ads that appeared across platforms and how they felt that was impacting their, impacting their privacy. So these were a lot of concerns that people were having. They were having very informed conversations about mm -hmm. that. Uh, I also feel that um, for the younger generation, yeah. my con one of my concerns as a mother mm -hmm. is that younger generation, children from younger generations are bombarded with a lot of inappropriate yeah. material, which they shouldn't be. Click on this and if you're 18 yeah. plus, you can get yeah. into some uh, website yeah. which is going to have maybe some violent material or something. Mm -hmm. Now, children will have a curiosity. Yeah. And in Pakistan, I don't know if there are those filters that parents can put. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your opinion about that? Because um, I was speaking to my daughter about this the other day and she says that uh, she was telling me how things just, you know, uh, would they pop up and yeah. the kids have an option whether they want to go into mm. sites that may not be right. And yeah. you can't have a parent watching over them all the yeah. time because often you have working parents, you have parents who are, you know, mother may be a yeah. stay-at-home mom, but she's yeah. looking after other kids or doing yeah. housework or something. So I think this was definitely a concern that a lot of our respondents also had. They talked about misinformation online. They talked about inappropriate, uh, inappropriate images or videos reaching children yes. uh, that you spoke about. And then also they... So other than inappropriate uh, videos, they also spoke about games and gay violent games like PUBG that also had, they felt like had an impact on children and the mental health of children, right? So a lot of these concerns were coming about. And once again, like the answer to that is to create more awareness in society, mm -hmm. right? And also hold these platforms accountable mm -hmm. to what kind of content they're dissemi disseminating and how they're disseminating right. it, right? Like for instance, YouTube has an app for kids now. So that happened after there was a youth scandal on YouTube and the con kind of content that was reaching children through their platform. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be more accountability of these social media platforms as well. The platforms need to Transparency have Transparency also, right? In their policies. Right. So access to internet usage. Now your study also said that the average internet user was young, educated and belonged to a certain so socioeconomic mm -hmm. class and that uh, that gave them access to utilities and entertainment on the internet. Yeah. Whereas your other, the rest of the country's youth may not have access to the yeah. internet where it's useful for them as a yeah. learning tool. Yeah. So uh, what would you, uh, what do you, uh, would you like to contribute to that? I mean, I think affordability is the main aspect, right? So we were talking about smartphones and how smartphones have become very, very accessible to people. Like smartphones are becoming cheaper by the day is what mm -hmm. we see. Um, but then other than that, like data packages, you have to talk about mm. internet packages, what the pricing of that is. So you, so the conversation then boils down to affordability. Is the internet affordable for a lot of people? Because if we talk about using internet on the phone, which a lot of people use, that's how a lot of people access the internet, data coverage and cellular coverage in this country, we have vast networks. So it is really about making the technology and uh, data inexpensive so that more people can access it. Okay, but okay, so now, all right, uh, the technology and all are there mm -hmm. and the, the access yeah. and the, uh, the amount yeah. that they have to pay, the affordability, mm -hmm. but at the same time, do you feel that um, the internet can have a potentially negative, any kind of a negative effect on society yeah. uh, based on maybe it goes against certain cultural norms of us? Of course, mm -hmm. it's a tool to learn also, yeah. but there's certain things out there that may not be an appropriate Content, but it is influencing mm -hmm. the younger generation. People are becoming a lot more out there. Yeah. Uh, girls' pictures are out there. They're yeah. being used in uh, wrong means. People can Photoshop a picture right. and put it in. Yeah. It can be used as a tool to completely ruin a person's uh, name, right. even wrongfully, if they haven't done something. Yeah. So once again, like to counter things like that, where you're morphing images and using images um, inappropriately, then you need laws that are in place, right? Which 
to a certain extent we do and then we need to increase the implementation of those laws we need to build confidence in people that they able, they're able to report these kind of things mm -hmm. to the FIA and pursue them because a lot of women sometimes report but then they don't end up pursuing yeah. the case so because it takes a lot of effort on their behalf right so that's, use the laws that are there to protect yeah. them thank you so yeah. much Amal for joining us unfortunately that's all the time no, we have for you. this segment today but that was very very interesting the, the okay. research that you did thank and the information so you gave us and uh, now we're going to go and speak to Mr. Faisal Fateh about how the stock market did today thank you so much for joining us, Faisal Fateh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Thanks a lot for taking me online. How did the markets do today? Because recently we've heard pretty grim news uh, from the stock market with the exception of maybe one day in this last week. So how did we do today in the stock market? Uh, well, unfortunately, the grim news continues. Uh, again, it was a very lackluster day. Market lost more than 150 points. Uh, main issue with the market is uh, that the volumes are very low. So the price discovery has become uh, very hard and uh, most of the investors, they are sidelined. I guess uh, they are waiting for, uh, you know, the religious holidays coming up next week. And we might okay. see some kind of activity after those religious holidays. But this right now, I guess the market be... would be very slow and without volumes for next uh, five to seven days. Which sectors would you expect there to be activity after the holidays? I think uh, the market is really in an oversold mode and we will see a lot of activity, not a lot of activity, but decent activity in blue chip stocks, in stocks belonging to oil and gas sector, banking sector, as well as a little bit activity in uh, textile sector, because they have become at a very, they have come down at a very positive, a very attractive multiples of, you know, five to six uh, uh, multiple to dividend. So and I guess would you still would say that those stocks are undervalued? Of course, they are undervalued right now. It's uh, down because of the overall sentiment. They are way down than their own intrinsic value or the fair value. And I think okay. that the institutions, especially the foreign buying, we have seen good foreign buying in last month, positive foreign buying. And I think so going forward, we will see foreign buying in blue chips. Thank you so much, Faisal Fateh, for joining us and apprising us about the stock market situation today. And that brings us to the end of our program. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. Thank you so much from our team on World Today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.